Today on The Hookup, I'm going to perform tests on all of the most popular types of individually addressable LED strips. We're going to talk about their technical specifications, and then I'm going to help you figure out which one is the best for your project. First of all, if you're looking for the one best LED strip, I unfortunately can't give you a single answer. The actual answer is that there are many factors to consider, and each application will likely have one type of strip that would be best suited for it. The purpose of this video is to help you determine what variety of individually addressable LED strip will work best based on the parameters of your project. For easy viewing purposes, I've linked the chart down in the video description with the results of my tests and a quick reference sheet for choosing LED strip variety. Before we get into it, I want to give a huge thanks to BTF Lighting for providing me with one of each type of their LED strips to perform my tests. They're a great vendor that I've used at least a dozen times, and they have both an Amazon and an AliExpress store. You should check out the links down in the description to see their huge LED selection. Let's start by getting a physical look at each strip type. In order to keep my tests as standardized as possible, each strip has the same LED density and waterproofing type. Specifically, these are all 150 LEDs per 5 meters and the IP65 silicon coated variety. But there are significantly more varieties to choose from. When you select your LED strips, you're typically going to get to select a few options. The first will be the color of the flexible PCB that the chips are mounted on. You can usually choose between black and white and it really makes no difference. Second is the pixel density or how many LEDs are in a single meter. I tend to use the 30 LEDs per meter variety because it makes power requirements a little bit more manageable, but they come in a variety of densities all the way up to 144 LEDs per meter. Third, you'll need to choose what type of waterproofing you want for your project. As I said before, the ones that I'm testing are IP65, which means that they're coated with a flexible clear silicon to keep water and dust out, but they aren't rated to be submerged in water. In my experience, they are both splash proof and rain proof. If you require more waterproofing, you can choose the IP67 version that come in sealed silicon sleeves. But keep in mind that they do get a bit annoying if you need to cut the strips to length. Of course, if your project is indoors, then you won't need any waterproofing, and that option is available as well. The last choice you need to make is the specific chip that will drive your individually addressable LEDs. This chip is where each of the strips gets their name, and I'll specifically be working with these seven chip types today. These LED strips all work with the same basic principle. Data is sent down a single wire where it's then read by a small microcontroller chip that produces a pulse width modulated signal that controls the brightness of each channel of an LED chip that contains a red segment, a green segment, and a blue segment. Each segment can have 256 levels of brightness, which results in 256 to the third power different colors that can be produced. If you see the term 5050 LED on the product pages, that just refers to the size of the LED chip, not necessarily the type of LED or any other components that may be integrated into it. As for their power draw specifications, there are hundreds of forum posts linking to the LED data sheets and giving generalized rules for calculating current draw, but I couldn't find much in the way of actual testing and comparison. So for this video, I've tested each of the LED strips by first measuring the current draw of the strip with all the LEDs off, then the current draw of a single channel of one pixel, then all the channels of one pixel, a single channel of all the pixels, and then the overall current draw for the entire strip with every channel at maximum brightness. I also evaluated the loss of color accuracy due to voltage drop on each strip type. We're gonna begin testing with the oldest model of LEDs that I tested, the WS2811s. A 12 volt strip shines when you wanna power these strips over large distances. Voltage drop is the term used to describe the difference in voltage at the beginning of a wire run and at the end of that wire run. Voltage drop is a result of the actual wire, or in this case, the copper traces on the LED strip contributing a significant amount of electrical resistance. If your output is five volts and you have 2.5 volts of drop over 30 feet, that means you'll only have 50% of your voltage left over. And that means the last LEDs are only going to receive 2.5 volts in total, which is not necessarily enough to accurately produce the colors that you selected. If you instead start with 12 volts and have that same 2.5 volt drop, that only represents a 21% change in voltage, and the remaining 9.5 volts will produce significantly more accurate colors than that 5 volt strip did. 
You can see the difference in color accuracy between the 12 volt WS2811s and the 5 volt WS2812B here when they're both outputting 100% brightness for the whole strip. The fix for this is to apply power at both ends of the LED strip in a method that's called power injection. But in cases where frequent power injection isn't possible, 12 volt strips like the WS2811 should typically be favored. Most of the time, WS2811 strips are the least expensive, but they do come with a few downsides. Most importantly, the cheapest versions of the WS2811 are not truly individually addressable. Typically, a WS2811 strip has a single microcontroller that actually powers three LED pixels, or a total of nine channels. This means that it isn't truly possible to control each LED, but instead, each pixel in your code represents a group of three LED chips. In my tests, the WS2811s had one of the highest power usages when no LEDs were lit, drawing 1.27 watts of power for their microcontrollers. And lighting the entire strip with pure white pulled a total of 1.64 amps, which is about 19.68 watts at full brightness. You can also see that the color accuracy is really good throughout the entire 5 meter strip, even without any power injection, which, as I mentioned before, is a huge advantage of the 12 volt strip over the 5 volt strip. As for use case, the WS2811 strips should be considered when the cost is an important factor or when power injection can't be easily accomplished, but not necessarily if you need to control each pixel individually. Next up on the list is by far the most common type of LED strip, the WS2812B, which unlike the WS2811 has the controller chip embedded directly in the LED package. The WS2812B only comes in 5 volt variety, so it's going to need more power injection than the WS2811 12 volt strip. But the smaller components means less material is required to produce the strip, and theoretically costs should be lower for the strips where each LED can be controlled individually. In my test, the WS2812B consumed half as much power as the WS2811s when no LEDs were lit. But as expected, the power consumption for the LEDs was almost exactly the same, at about 60 milliwatts per channel. And the full strip consumed only 13.6 watts, which is about 6 watts less than the WS2811s. I also have another new variety of WS2812Bs called the Eco. In my test, the Eco version did have the lowest baseline power consumption, needing only 56 milliwatts with no LEDs lit. Being 5 volt strips, both types really struggled to reproduce accurate colors near the end of the strip due to voltage drop, with the Eco version performing slightly worse than the non-Eco version. In general, I use WS2812B strips as my general purpose LED strips. They're relatively cheap, they come in a huge variety of pixel densities, waterproofing types, and strip colors, and they're compatible with basically every library that's meant to control individually addressable LEDs. So what would cause an LED strip to be incompatible with a library? These libraries control something that's called chip timing, which is the rate at which the LEDs expect new data. In strips that contain the SK9822 chip, timing is handled a bit differently. Instead of having a hard-coded timing that your microcontroller needs to adhere to, it includes another wire that's called the clock pin. This clock pin dictates the rate of data transfer between the microcontroller and the chip. It not only means that the microcontroller can be pushed to its maximum potential by speeding up the rate of the data transfer more than the WS2811 or 2812Bs would allow, but it also allows for the data transfer to be slowed down if frames per second aren't that important and the microcontroller has a significant secondary workload. The SK9822 chips had the highest idle power consumption of any of the 5 volt strips, but had comparable power consumption numbers for lighting the entire strip up with full white. One important thing to note was the significantly worse color accuracy due to voltage drop in these strips. When you inject power into a 2812B, it's generally enough to power each end of a 5 meter strip. But in the SK9822 strips, I would suggest injecting power every 2.5 meters to maintain color accuracy. The SK9822 also costs a little bit more than the 2812B, and it requires an additional conductor for the clock pin. But in situations where errors and animations are unacceptable and data accuracy is the most important consideration, the SK9822 strips are well worth the increase in price. The other downfall to serial communication is that since all the data is being passed over a single wire, any break in the chain will cause the entire strip after that to fail. The WS2813 strips are made to address this downfall. 
On the WS2813, there are two different data lines labeled DI and BI, meaning data in and backup in. This allows the strip to continue functioning in the event of a dead pixel because the BI channel will act as a pass-through. As long as two consecutive LEDs don't fail, the rest of the LED strip should continue to function. This makes the WS13 strips ideal for situations where the strips can't be accessed for repair, like for instance if you were going to encase them in epoxy. Unfortunately, like the SK9822, the WS2813 strips performed very poorly in terms of color accuracy. They exhibited noticeable yellowing after about 45 pixels at full brightness. Aside from that, the power consumption was predictably less given the increased internal resistance, and it required only 12.15 watts for the entire strip when lit at full brightness. I'd expect this number would go up significantly with more power injection points. If you want a backup data channel without the voltage drop issues, then the WS2815 may be the answer. The WS2815 is a 12 volt strip, and as you can see, there is no significant depreciation in color rendering throughout the entire strip, even at full brightness. The trade-off is price and power consumption. You can see that there's some really odd behavior in the WS2815 when it comes to current draw. Basically, a single pixel draws the exact same amount of current at 50% red as it does at 50% white, even though the white consists of the red, green, and blue pixels. An awesome commenter in another one of my videos explained why, but the Cliffs notes is that each channel is powered in series instead of in parallel. And if only a single channel is wanted, the other two are then shorted out by a transistor-resistor combo to keep the current constant. The WS2815 has both the highest idle power consumption at 3.52 watts and the highest full white power consumption at 20.18 watts per 150 LEDs. That being said, they're going to be extremely reliable due to the backup channel, and they are great at reproducing the correct colors despite voltage drop in the strip. The WS2815 seemed pretty great, but I've saved my favorite LED variety for last. The SK6812 is very similar to the WS2812B in that it requires only 5 volts, it has an embedded microcontroller, and it lacks a backup channel. But the SK6812 has the ability to control an additional channel of LEDs that's used for controlling a large white segment on the 5050 LED package. Normally, RGB strips produce white by turning the red, green, and blue channels on to the same percentage, which produces a slightly blue or purple light. By having a dedicated white channel on the LED, you can produce a familiar true white light in either warm white, neutral white, or cool white varieties. It's true that it does make the programming a little more complicated since you're sending four channels instead of three, but the results are well worth it. Anytime I'm using LED strips in place of normal light bulbs, I always opt for the RGBW variety. For applications like outdoor holiday LEDs, it's much less important since I want those to make crazy patterns, but for adding subtle backlighting while still being able to get fancy from time to time, the SK6812 RGBW strips are absolutely the best. In my test, the 6812s had moderately high power consumption at idle of 0.83 watts and 14.4 watts when fully lit. You can also see that they had a significant amount of yellowing around LED 90, but that's not really a valid test since you wouldn't produce white light by turning on the R, G, and B strips. You'd actually just use the white channel. And while the white channel draws more current than any other single channel, lighting the whole strip with white results in only 10 watts of power draw, the lowest white power consumption of any of the strips that I tested, with the added benefit of nearly perfect color accuracy throughout the entire strip without power injection. So as you can see, there's not really a one-size-fits-all LED strip, but instead, they all have specific strengths and weaknesses. If I was forced to pick a single LED strip type to use in all of my projects, I would absolutely choose the SK6812 RGBW strips, either in warm white or cool white variety depending on my use case. Maybe in the future there's going to be a 12 volt RGBW strip with backup data, but for now the SK6812 is my go-to strip. Thank you to all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. If you'd like to support my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup. Yeah.